that's what we're going to see this this uh, winter when we run out of of, of uh, sufficient uh, uh, fossil fuels, and some people are going to start freezing. We will be much much more worried about cold waves than heat waves. But that's not how the media present it, and that's why we're in the trouble. Is it really the focus on global warming as global warming, or is it also a little bit the focus on global warming as kind of this ideological struggle that fulfills almost an emotional need for for many people much more than an environmental need? Why is there no you know Manhattan-like project into nuclear fusion or into nuclear energy in general? There are many tools we would have at our disposal that could really help with global warming, but sometimes, I'm exaggerating here slightly, but sometimes I almost feel like that some might don't want to go global warming fully away because they kind of put all their heart and soul into it. But now, by the way, something I think we partially also see with COVID, it kind of bleeds over into a, you know, a cultural moral problem, and this strike is much more difficult yeah, to well, overcome. The smartest ways to do good with his think tank the Copenhagen Consensus. He has worked with hundreds of the world's top economists and seven Nobel laureates to find and promote the most effective solutions to the world's greatest challenges, from disease and hunger to climate and education. And so if you're genuinely concerned about doing your duty to your culture and the planet, Bjorn is a great person to know about, to read about, and to follow. Uh, I think that might be more true of him than of any thinker on the policy front that I've ever encountered. For his work, Lomberg was named one of Time Magazine's 100 most influential people in the world. He's a visiting fellow at Stanford University's Hoover Institution and is a frequent commentator in print and broadcast media for outlets including The New York Times, Wall Street Journal, The Guardian, CNN, Fox, and the BBC. His monthly column is published in many languages by dozens of influential newspapers across all continents. He is also a best-selling author whose books include False Alarm, How Climate Change Panic Costs Us Trillions, Hurts the Poor, and Fails to Fix the Planet. Bjorn has discussed that book at some length on my podcasts, among many other places. He's also written The Skeptical Environmentalist, Cool It, How to Spend $75 Billion Dollars to Make the World a Better Place, which is a fascinating read. The Nobel Laureate's Guide to the Smartest Targets for the World, 2016 to 2030. And Prioritizing Development, a Cost-Benefit Analysis of the UN's Sustainable Development Goals. So I have a friend, he's a really good friend of mine, and I've known him since I was in college. And He's a tough guy. I mean, he grew up in a, a, under rather poverty-stricken circumstances in northern Alberta, really on a frontier piece of land. Like, it had only been broken 50 years before by his father, who was a longshoreman and an ex-military guy. Good guy, right. his father. But this guy gr grew up, and he is tough. He worked in lead smelters, and he wandered around western Canada. And he was my roommate when I went to college, and is still a good friend of mine. And he ended up working with, like, delinquents. He went into social work, oddly enough, and and he ended up working with some of the worst delinquents in, in Canada. And he's a really good guy, and he likes to help people get better. But he isn't naive at all. And then yeah. part of the reason that he was good at working with the delinquents was because there were no tricks they could get up to that he couldn't see right through. And that was partly because he had a real integrated shadow. I mean, I'll give you an example of him. <laughs> So one day, in, I was living in this town called Grand Prairie, and it was at the height of the oil boom. And so it was a rough town, and there were lots of rough bars in it, and lots of young men in there with plenty of money and plenty of... They'd come in for, you know, three days after being out in minus 40 weather, working right. on the oil rigs, and they were ready to party, man. And we had a party one night in this kind of frat house that I went to college in, and about, oh, way too many people showed up. And some of them were real troublemakers. And... One, we had a table that was pretty full of beer bottles and vodka bottles and so forth. And one guy just went over, like, po tore the leg off and knocked the table over. And then a bunch of us got together and chased them all out. And this friend of mine, he said, oh, they'll be back. And so he went upstairs and he put on some steel-toed cowboy boots. It was just like a bloody western. He came marching down the stairs. And just as he entered the living room, there was a big knock on the front door. It was these hooligans coming back to cause grief. And he... He just didn't break stride. He opened the door 
he pulled open the door and there was a guy standing there ready to fight and he kicked him underneath the chin with his steel toe cowboy boot knocked him right over the the front porch and the you know and the battle was on but that was exactly what he was like you know I mean, right. and he had his shadow was integrated you could tr- he was a great roommate he yeah. he it reciprocated everything i always knew if i bought groceries one week he'd buy it the next like he was a straight yeah. shooter you could trust him but yeah. he was not naive man and yeah. that made him able to deal with delinquents and to help them so that's part of that integration of that shadow Yeah, um I, I go very deeply into the shadow in in a chapter in my last book The Laws of Human Nature and I try and talk about how one integrates the shadow because it's not it's not an easy answer for that. You know, people are kind of perplexed. Well, I have this dark side and I explain a lot of where it comes from and how a lot of your aggressive impulses like the room of 2-year-olds that you were talking about you have that as well. I'm talking to the people that are we my readers you have that aggressiveness when you were young and it got socialized out of you and then it got kind of got repressed and it's like a, a lost self that lives inside of you and is screaming to come out how do you integrate it and so the main thing is you have to be aware that you have this shadow side you have you can't run away from it you have to acknowledge that it exists you almost have yeah, to embrace well, it in a way a good parent too does everything he or she can not to repress that like what you want to do with children is you want to like you want them to be forceful you want them to have some power exactly. you want them to integrate that that capacity for aggression into well, let's say lucid conversation you want them to yeah. be able to stand up for themselves in family yeah. discussions if you just punish them for being aggressive let's say for talking back or something like that you don't yeah. guide that into more sophisticated development you see this in schools too now you know when my kids went to school this was so dumb I, i we had a rule in our house which was you don't have to follow stupid rules that's a And, good rule but if you get caught you have to put up with consequences but right so one rule was the school had not only could you not throw snowballs you couldn't make them And so they were trying to yeah exactly you should shake your head that's for sure it's like because their answer and this was all politically correct nonsense you know non competitive games we're only going to play non competitive games yeah. it's like yeah, first of all you know I studied Piaget yeah a hockey game is not competitive exactly because in a hockey game well everybody no one brings a basketball everybody plays hockey so that's cooperation And then on the yeah. team you have to cooperate and like if you're the star but you never pass you're just a dumb son of a bitch you're not the star. And yeah. so there's tremendous amount of cooperation in all those competitive games they're integrated and this yeah. idea that you know exactly. you make children better by not allowing them to be competitive oh, it's, it's so it's, it's disgusting. It's, it is. It's that yeah. well that's the Freudian devouring mother right that's oh well yeah. everyone's safe and No one's going well, to ever hurt that's, anyone. And that's it's, kind it's, of where a lot of young people are, 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 you know, they enter the world where they've been coddled, where they think that there are no winners, that everyone is, you know, it's just win-win situations. And that's where they get really shocked by the realities of the world. So all this coddling and this idea that there doesn't have to be a winner. We don't have to get prizes for first place. Everybody should oh, yeah. get a prize. You know, all you're doing is setting your, your children up for, for massive... Uh, you know shocks when they enter the world and they see that it's not like that yeah and then they get disillusioned and depressed you know or traumatized yep. by it. i mean when my my son's hockey team in his school they won the the city championship which was a big deal you know and the school was pretty happy about that to to his credit so was the coach but the principal who was this authoritarian empath she was an awful person i thought authoritarian you know, said, empath well, that's empath. interesting yeah well yeah so she used like more virtue yeah. as a club yeah. oh no it was yeah well there's plenty of those people around yeah, yeah, and she yeah, said yeah. well really today we're all winners and the and the coach had the yeah Nazi. exactly no it is sickening because it and yeah. you know my son was just appalled by it, but the coach had enough guts he said no no the the hockey team won and it's not like the kids in the school were jealous some of them were yeah. obviously but most of them were really happy like you are when your sports team wins that yeah. you know and most people are generous enough so that they're able to celebrate someone else's victory without And that's the same I saw this with birthday parties. I just bloody well hated this. It's like, well every child gets a gift bag. 